chemical acid pricing model and we began or did a lot of it or some of it last time. So let's begin again with the same stuff from last time. Basic assumptions. Let's make a quick review of the there will be a lot of calculation in the exam. No. 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 Zero. No. That's very good. So, uh, the first assumption was that investors are price takers. All right. Price takers. Yes. What's the next assumption? Rational. Hmm? Investors are rational. What is the next one? Hmm? Equilibrium. The market is at equilibrium. Identical holding periods. Identical? Invest identical, so similar or identical. Investment horizon. Another one was no transaction. Uh, no transaction costs. No taxes. No transaction costs. Actually, usually taxes and taxation falls under the transaction cost category. The publicly, uh, the university, the publicly traded. Okay, so, so tradable assets. Tradable assets. Another assumption was that same investment tools. Same investment tools, we call these homogeneous expectations. So everyone is doing the same. Did we say efficient portfolio? No, we didn't say. We didn't say. So these are the basic assumptions. That's it. So we draw a line here. Now we go through the results. So we should exclude efficient portfolio from the assumptions? Yeah. Because it was the we, we, we wrote. Well, maybe I made a mistake. So the first conclusion that we have is that then the market portfolio is efficient. This is actually a result or an outcome of these assumptions. So if everyone is rational and everyone in the market is in equilibrium, usually these two will mostly give us that the result, the fundamental result is that the market is efficient. In other words, the first result is market efficiency. The second fundamental result is that the market portfolio is optimal. So market optimality. That's the second. Up to between risky assets and risky assets. Well, just the way I explained it last time. Were you here last time? Apparently not, maybe. Maybe you just left. You can't ask those questions. So, market is optimal, okay? You'll read exactly what it means. The next result is let's see that. The market is on the efficient frontier. Now, if we say that it's on the efficient frontier, it already means, in a sense, that the market is efficient. Only efficient markets, but on the efficient frontier means that the market portfolio is itself on the efficient frontier. Okay? So, also, it means that optimality. In other words, if it's on the efficient frontier, it's an optimal portfolio. 
Okay, let's see what's next. The next result is that the risk premium of any security is proportional to its risk. So risk premium is proportional to, ah, let's do this, risk. See, the guy gets offended. What can I do? <laughs> he missed once, he missed twice, he's going deeper down. All right, so uh, proportional to risk. The next very important result is that risk is, let, let, let's try different. Let's phrase it that beta measures, measures, measures risk. So, beta measures risk, okay? In other words, beta measures risk and the risk premium will be therefore proportional to beta. Let's see what else we have. Uh, this will apply equally well to both assets, to individual individual assets, and will apply equally well to portfolios. Portfolios. So. Well, guys, what's your problem? I had an outside question. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, if you're asking for a penalty, I'll give you, okay? So, beta measures the risk of an individual asset, and the risk premium on an individual asset will be proportional to beta. But it can also take beta of a portfolio, and it will measure the risk premium on a portfolio. All right, that's fairly straightforward. Let's see what else we have. Okay, well, these are the main results. So now we move on to some implications. So, these are the assumptions, these are the direct results. So what else does it mean? So, implications. Let's see now a number of implications. First of all, if you remember, first of all, if you remember, we had capital allocation line. And capital allocation line gave us the possibilities where we can use portfolios. In other words, it gave us the combination of portfolios which are actually attainable. That was, we can construct these portfolios. Well, when you use the market portfolio, we get to the concept of capital market line. Capital market line. So, if I have to draw it over here, I did it already last time. This is the efficient frontier. The market itself will be on the efficient frontier. In other words, I'm already saying number three, and risk-free somewhere here, you draw the tangency, and this will be capital market line. In other words, the capital market line is effectively the capital allocation line when constructed with the market portfolio. All right? Let's see what's next. Uh, passive versus active strategy. So, passive versus active. Passive simply means that you choose the market portfolio or you choose a particular index and you mimic it. Active means that you're trying to beat the market, you're trying to select stocks and you hope that these stocks will do better than the market because you typically think that you can choose stocks better than other investors. Well, the implication for the 
from the capital asset pricing model and from market efficiency is that active strategies are typically not working. In other words, uh, capital asset pricing model says active strategies are not worth it. They're actually saying that active strategies are losing strategies because an active strategy and a passive strategy based on efficiency will provide you with the same gross return, but net of transaction costs actually the active strategy will underperform because an active strategy will certainly require information costs, management costs, trading costs and a whole bunch of other costs which a passive strategy uh, has a lot less. A passive strategy essentially a computer generates the portfolio and every now and then it rebalances a little bit. So active strategy is no good according to the capital asset pricing model. All right, it's fairly simple. Let's see what's next. The next is, and I did it last time, the mutual fund theorem. And the mutual fund theorem simply says that there is one and only one portfolio, the market portfolio, which is sufficient to satisfy all investors' needs. That if I'm very risk averse, I'll choose a little bit of the market portfolio and a lot of the safe assets. And if someone is risk tolerant or a lot more risk tolerant, they'll choose a lot of the market and a little from the safe assets. So the mutual fund theorem simply says that the market is the market portfolio is sufficient to satisfy everyone's needs and theoretically everyone should just be holding some percentage of their portfolio in the market and the rest in risk-free assets. So that's the mutual fund theorem. Let's see what else we have. Uh, the next implication is the so-called logical inconsistency of capital asset pricing model. So, what is the logical inconsistency of capital asset pricing model? It is associated with passive and active investment. It simply says the following. If everyone is rational, and if the market is rational, and then everyone behaves in a passive manner, this simply means that no one will do research, no one will study the market, no one will do anything, then the market will not be rational. In other words, if everyone expects the market to be perfectly rational, then they won't study, they won't research, they won't do anything, then they'll just invest whatever the market is. Well, if everyone just invests whatever the market is, uh, essentially, the market cannot be rational. Rationality means that uh, investors actually study the market, they perform fundamental analysis, they read the news, they read everything. In other words, they are, that investors are, well informed. But on the other hand, if the market is efficient, investors don't need to be well informed. So what you have here is information, information and efficiency. Information drives efficiency, and efficiency drives information. But if the market is efficient, then there is no point in using the information. So it is logically inconsistent. Is that fairly clear? It makes sense or not? Not really. All right. Let's see. Let's see what's next. So the next one is risk. Risk 
premium. So with the risk premium, I'll write it out over here is the expected return of some asset A will simply be equal to the risk-free asset R of risk-free, the return of the risk-free asset plus the risk premium. And then we say that the risk premium itself equals beta and times the return of the market or the expected return of the whole market. And then we can substitute RP in here. Now, this applies again equally well to individual assets and applies also to the portfolio. All right. So that's fairly straightforward. Let's see what's next. So these are the expected returns on securities, the relationship, uh, portfolio's risk premium. Oh, so the next concept is that of security market line. So here's what we got. It is getting somewhat confusing. First of all is capital asset allocation line. Capital allocation line. Then you have capital market line. Then you have now SML. SML. Let's see now SML is the that's security security market line and there is one other which is also very confusing security characteristic line security characteristic line so the capital allocation line is very straightforward these are the different types of portfolios we, that we can simply get, that we can simply attain. These are the attainable portfolios. Capital market line is the attainable portfolios where the risky portfolio is the whole market portfolio. So this is associated, these are just attainable. The market line is attainable when the risky portfolio is the market portfolio. Okay, now let's see. Uh, the SML, the SML, security market line works equally well with individual assets individual assets and works well with portfolios now there is no miracle here it effectively uses this property that the risk premium works equally well with individual assets and works equally well with portfolios. So this is what the security market line is saying. And finally, the security characteristic line is associated with individual assets, individual assets, and it represents the regression line regression of the individual assets to the market. And this is what I showed you two lectures ago. So, you get on the one axis return of the market, on the other axis return of the asset, and you try to run the regression. Alright? Okay, so security market line. Let's see what's uh, next. Uh, what's
What's next is some uses. What do we use the uh, capital asset pricing model? Three fundamental uses are management, portfolio management. Portfolio management, in other words, managers will use capital asset pricing model to tailor individuals' portfolios. In other words, we may use the same market portfolio as the risky asset, but for me, I'll use one percentage of the risky for a second person, a second percentage. In other words, when you construct portfolio, so we call it portfolio management or portfolio construction, they will use the capital asset pricing model to tailor the risk return characteristics of the portfolio to the individual. All right, so portfolio management. The next one is capital budgeting. Capital budgeting decisions. You're simply a manager. You're trying, for example, to decide should we use a new refinery? Should we actually make a new refinery or not make a new refinery? And this is a capital budgeting decision. Capital budgeting decision simply means a decision whether to make an investment or not make an investment. In other words, this is a decision which has multi-period effects. So a capital budgeting decision is an efficient decision which will have which will affect more than one period. It will affect the revenues and the cost of more than one period. Well, how do we use it in capital budgeting decisions? Well, Capital budgeting decisions are associated with the most or one of the most fundamental concepts in finance, and this is called net present value, right? And net present value is associated with cash flow in period zero, there is nothing in it, plus cash flow in period one, this is plus one plus R to the power of one, cash flow period two, one plus r squared. We're taking this in 360, the decision rule. Correct. Yeah. So, the idea is that this r will be used by capital asset pricing model. Capital asset pricing model will be used to find out r. In other words, are you discounting by or with 6%, 7%, 8%, or 9%? In other words, how much you're going to be discounting with? This is where you get it. You get it from capital asset pricing model. So I understand that you're doing it. I'm just explaining where is the capital asset pricing model. Or you also use it there also too. The no, capital no, asset. no. Okay, well, this is where it is. It's entering from capital asset pricing model. In other words, R itself will have a uh, risk free component and a risk premium. Okay? So, essentially, capital asset pricing model is used to compute this portion of the, we call this R, discount factor. Discount factor. Discount factor. All right, so let's see what's next. In number nine, let's add over here is utility pricing. In many countries like Bulgaria, the United States, uh, you will tell me if it's valid for Saudi Arabia, uh, utilities are typically not allowed to make huge profits. There is typically government intervention in the utility markets. In other words, governments definitely want to control the price of water and the price of electricity. And therefore, if the government just sets the price to 
10 cents per kilowatt, it may turn out that the utility company will not be making any money. Well, is this, does this present a problem? And the answer is, in the very short term, it presents no problem. Consumers benefit at the expense of the utility company. In the long term, this is a huge problem. The utility company will simply go bankrupt. When it goes bankrupt, it shuts down, consumers get no electricity whatsoever. Question. Uh, doesn't the government uh, subsidize the utility? Yes, there are two ways to go about it. One way to go about it is to give them a subsidy. Government will simply say, 10 cents it is, run as huge losses as you can, and we'll subsidize it. So, what the subsidy will do is actually, it is actually subsidize the BMWs of the executives, their villas on the beaches, their winter resorts, whatever, and summer resorts, whatever. So, once the government gives them those subsidies, then the incentive is, let's spend as much as we can, and the government's going to cover the difference, right? In other words, yes, this is what many governments do, and this is what governments typically find out. The executives of those companies, seeing that they will not sustain losses, begin to abuse the subsidy. We call this problem in economics moral hazard. Moral hazard. Moral hazard. I know the government's going to bail me out. Well, let me get a company jet. A company jet, right? This means he's not going to, he's a big executive, he's not going to drive from Riyadh to Jeddah, right? <laughs> he's going to use the company jet, right? Well, of course, it's coming at the taxpayer's expense, right? Now, getting to the other alternative. The other alternative is the government will say, well, we think based on your risk that you should be earning 12%. Return and therefore we compute you, give you some cost allowance, and we give you the return. The return means profit, so cost plus profit. They end up with the revenue. Once they end up with the revenue, they price the product, the electricity or the water, to deliver that revenue. So in utility pricing, the step is, well, let's see what is going to be the cost, let's see what's going to be the revenue, let's see, sorry, the, 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 the return, and then we fix the pricing to satisfy those two. Well, the return, whether the utility should be making 10% or 12% or 14%, again, is based on this Formula. In other words, they use capital as a price model to justify the return which they would give to investors because usually the government will fix the price. In other words, what they will do is say, hey, uh, 10 is not enough. With 10 uh, cents, we will be getting only 6% return and the risk free is five and a half and the utility will say well half a percent is not enough to cover our risks financial operational and all sorts of other risks so they say well according to us we're half risky as the market so if the market premium is eight percent then we have a beta of one half we need a four percent return five and a half is the risk free and four nine and a half so they'll set the pricing to give them nine and a half. All right, is this clear? All right, let's see what else we get. All right, so we have capital asset pricing models. And indices. Oh, let me add one other important piece. Let's add one more piece. The next piece is risk of individual asset. So, risk of individual asset. And if you remember very early on, the risk of an individual asset
acid, we usually measure it with its sigma, which is the return, or sorry, volatility of return. So, for an individual asset, this was the risk measure. But now, capital asset pricing model tells us that it is beta. So, the volatility of return is better said to be the variance of return. And what beta represents, represents the covariance with the market. So beta is the covariance with market. So let's explain this a little bit. Let's explain this a little bit. You may get a stock which is highly volatile, has huge volatility. And if it has huge volatility, it may actually uh, correlate very highly with the market and it may actually have a beta of a little bit less than one. That's a possibility. So, it may have very high own variance, but the covariance with the market could be low. It could be quite the opposite, however. It may have relatively low variance, and yet it may have a very high covariance with the market. So variance of what? Hmm? Variance of the asset of itself. Variance of itself. In other words, whether it swings high or low. So if this is the price, this will represent one variance, and this will represent a different variance, all right? So, if this is stock A, and this is stock B, its own variance of A swings widely, so A has a very high variance, and B has a relatively low variance, all right? So, the answer is, according to capital asset pricing model, and that's important to understand, is that the first measure, the volatility of return, is not the appropriate measure, but only beta is the correct appropriate measure. So that's an important lesson from capital asset pricing model. For an individual asset, its own volatility is not the appropriate measure of risk. Only its covariance with the market, which we just call beta. All right? So that's the next important piece of information. Uh, let's see now about so-called uh, index models. So, index models. So, what is simply an index model? The idea is that of assumption number six. Assumption number six was tradability. Tradable assets. In other words, if we want to make capital asset pricing model, we cannot use all assets because all assets are not tradable. What we must use is are some tradable assets for which we have good market data. Sometimes even for real estate we don't have good market data because houses don't buy and sell every day, especially in the neighborhood. So, when it comes to making it what's called operational, in other words, how do we make it in the real world? In the real world, we'll ignore a lot of non-tradable assets. We will probably ignore huge indexes, like an index with 10,000 stocks, and we'll focus ourselves to a sufficiently broad index for which we have observations every day, 
every week, possibly every hour, possibly every minute. So, uh, we make it by using the index. And this is a stock index. And for the United States, the most popular index to work with, which is sufficiently broad, that of course, standard and poor, we just call it S&P 500. Now, some people like to use Dow Jones, and that's okay. But Dow Jones is considered to be too narrow on the one hand, presumably it uses only industrial companies, of course it uses pharmaceuticals and other things. But the other problem is Dow Jones uses only 30 companies. And these 30 companies essentially might not be providing sufficient diversification. Diversification becomes relatively good once you have 30, 40, 50, or 60. So it may be that those 30 that are chosen there do not provide sufficiently good diversification. You know, once you enter uh, the portfolio increases to 50, 60, or 80, the benefits of diversification begins to go down rapidly. In other words, if this is if this is your complete or perfect market volatility, you're using, let's say, only 10, only 10 assets, you will not be able to diversify quite well to the point of the market. When you use 20, you will have diversified, but there will be still some risk. In other words, you will not have attained very good diversification. All right. Once you're into 30, you're going to be very close. The idea is that early on the curve is very steep and then it becomes remarkably flat. Well, the curvature from steep to relatively flat occurs somewhere in the area of 50, 70. This time we'll say even 40, 70. Now, if you already have 50, 60, 70 stocks, you're pretty much already decent or fairly well diversified. If you're using only 20, maybe you're not very well diversified. So this is one of the fundamental criticisms of Dow Jones. But there's a second criticism to Dow Jones to be used as the primary index. And this is that it uses solid, steady, reliable companies. Well, if these are solid, steady, reliable, and they're chosen in the first place to be that way, and of course they're big, it simply means that probably Dow Jones companies will have a risk which is a little below, a little less riskier than the overall market. So Dow Jones has some biases and therefore S&P is considered much better. Now on the other hand, NASDAQ has got other drawbacks. It actually includes too many volatile companies, too immature to be representing sufficiently well the whole market. Even though NASDAQ may have a large percentage, large percentage of all stocks of the market, it's still, you know, because their market capitalization is not big enough, they're still not well representative. All right, questions? Uh, so, I just have a question. The New York Stock Exchange. Okay. It will include the Dow Jones. Inside it, will, the 30 companies will be listed in the New York Stock Exchange, and the Dow yeah. Jones is just an index. Mm -hmm. And the S&P is the same thing. Uh, no, okay, so, so here's the thing. It is not really necessary that all Dow Jones companies are actually traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Okay. Microsoft has been traded for many years on NASDAQ, yeah. but Microsoft is in Dow Jones. Oh, okay. All right? So uh, the index does not depend on where it's traded, all right? Okay. Now, there's only one index which depends on where it's traded. The NASDAQ, the NASDAQ index is composed of stocks which are traded only on the NASDAQ 
exchange, which of course is just an electronic exchange. There are no real bits, okay? So, uh, is it like ETFs? What do you mean like ETF? Um, no, no, I understand. No, no, this is what, what, what we're trying to do is how do we make how do we make the capital asset price model operational? What the ETF does or gives the ordinary investors is a low cost alternative to acquiring a market portfolio or a, we call this properly a proxy market proxy market proxy proxy means that it is very similar to it means that it approximates or market proxy is an index that will very closely track the whole market and the whole market is a completely extra abstract concept using both tradable and non-tradable assets. They have the whole stock market, and the stock market certainly means that they are all tradable. But if you have 12,000 stocks, how do you weight them in the index? So rather than go through the complex or complexity of weighting and whatnot, you can use a market proxy, maybe only 500 or maybe only 50, and they will co-flow or they will correlate with the complete market, maybe 99%. In other words, they'll have a high correlation, sufficiently enough not to be important for practical purposes. All right. So, uh, if the market gives you 9.83, and your index, market index, will be giving you plus or minus 0 0.02, from an economic and from an investment point of view, two hundredths of a percent is economically insignificant. So, the market proxy will give you the return of the complete market within a very close range, probably a couple of hundreds of one percent, not even one tenth of one percent, all right? So that is the idea of a proxy, and the idea of a market proxy, of course, is an index. This is what indexes do. So the index will be a market proxy, and the idea of using an index is you get the quote for the index every second, every minute, every hour, every day, etc. etc. So that is the idea. Alright? Let's see what else we, we have. Uh, mean the sufficient, okay, estimation, that's pretty much it. Uh, let's see standard error. I'm done with this one. Oh, so now we get again with the index models. Uh, to uh, forecasting, forecasting Vegas. All right. So first of all, one of the problems with uh, forecasting Vegas is the elementary problem of estimation. In other words. You will try in a pure econometric manner to run a regression of the excess return on the stock to the excess return on the market. Well, the excess return on the market itself is a little bit of an estimate because you got to get an estimate of the mean of the market. Then, because you have observations, in other words, we have a sample. So, Estimation is based on a sample, sample observation of the market and sample observation of the stock. The estimation itself will be random. You get those t distributions, right? So when you estimate the beta, will have some t distribution. So you estimate that the beta is 0.9 but you're actually getting a fairly wide confidence interval. It may get 0.9 beta, but the confidence interval may be 0.5.
so that the one sigma range, the one sigma range, in other words, the mean plus one sigma to the left and one sigma to the right, will be 1.4 and 0.4. So, the very first problem of even forecasting the weather is that you don't even have an idea, is it 0.6? Or is it one? So what you even start with is already a big problem in the first place. Have a question? No. So that's the first big problem. The second problem which follows out of the first one is that a lot of times the statistical estimates of the beta are themselves insignificant. Their insignificance simply means that the error, the error of the estimate is too large to the estimated value. And the ratio between the two of them kind of like gives you the so-called T value. In other words, if you estimate the mean to be 0.9 and the error is 0.9, then <laughs> essentially the model is not significant and therefore the beta is statistically not significant. In other words, you cannot reject the null hypothesis that the beta is zero. So you get a number, but you can't even rely on that number because the confidence interval is extremely wide. So that's the second problem. And then finally, when you try to forecast the beta even though you may have estimated it reasonably well. Now what you have to understand, you estimate the beta for one stock might be very insignificant. For a different stock you might get a fairly decent or good estimate. In other words, you get 0.9 with a relatively small error, maybe 0.1. The problem is that still beta is dynamic. Dynamic simply means that this year the beta of the company, the true beta of the company, if we knew it, is 0.9. But next year, the beta of the company can rise to 1.1. Why would this be? Well, for a whole number of reasons. For example, the company begins to use a brand new project, and the project is significant, very significant to the size of the company. For example, the company has only or operates only four shopping malls and it decides to invest and, you know, get into a fifth mall. Well, the fifth mall is relatively large, so it may actually begin to provide 30% of revenues. But of course, a brand new mall in a brand new town, which is not tested, could be highly volatile investment. It could turn very good return or it could turn very bad return. In other words, the next mall could increase the overall riskiness of the whole company altogether. So because of the general nature of the business operations, the volatility may increase or the riskiness may increase. Or they may get into a business. Let's call these uh, uh, businesses are called pro-cyclical. So, a pro-cyclical business is a business which usually gains more, relatively more, during an economic boom and loses relatively more during an economic recession. So, if they enter into a new pro-cyclical business, of course, pro-cyclicality typically increases the beta. In other words, if your business is not pro-cyclical, you're selling all these tools based whether the economy is booming or whether the economy is collapsing, you can reasonably be assured that the economic cycle will not affect your tools base. Maybe competitive uh, competition could do, but otherwise, if you're getting into the toothpaste business, you're probably not going to be affected by a business cycle. So, the less pro-cyclical the business is, the lower is the overall beta. That's a general rule of thumb. The more pro-cyclical it is, the more sensitive 
is the stock to the overall market, and therefore the higher the beta. So they may just enter a highly pro-cyclical business. They would be thinking that they are diversified, say, oh, we are in the toothpaste business, mouthwash business, let's say glasses business, and glasses are typically very non-cyclical. I mean, boom or bust, you need glasses, you buy glasses, all right? You know, food, food. People who are not just going to eat a lot less or cut down on their nutrition just because there was a cycle. And they say, oh, we're into all of those businesses, let's diversify to some other new business. But that new business may turn out to be highly pro cyclical. Management things, because they have three or four lines of business, by introducing the new line of business, they're actually diversifying the operations. And when they diversify from four lines of business into five lines of business, management would think that they are lowering the overall risk of the company, but it may turn out the exact opposite because they're getting themselves into a highly pro cyclical business, they're actually raising the risk because they think of the risk as in terms of volatility of revenues. Well, the measure of risk is not volatility of revenues, it is the covariance of the stock to the market. So, management has a different view of what risk means from the actual measure of risk, at least from the capital asset pricing model. So, the problem with forecasting beta is that the beta itself may change due to the changing nature of the business itself, okay? So that's another fundamental problem. And let's see, I think we're pretty much actually done. I'm not going to cover 7.3 which is a uh, capital asset price model and a number of statistical or econometric studies by Fama and French and a whole bunch of other guys that all are trying to do the same old thing. Is it significant or is it not significant? Is it efficient or is it not efficient? If we add per size, is the result going to change or remain the same? If we add book to market value or ratio, is the result going to be significant or not? If we add firm size, huge firms versus small firms, is it going so essentially what empirical, we call these empirical studies will try to do is try to test whether one other factor which they think might be important, whether it is indeed important or not, from again an econometric point of view. Is this good enough for today? Yes. All right.